we we have now introduced uh, the building safety bill, having um, gone through quite a lengthy um, pre-legislative scrutiny process, and we've responded to um, uh, the comments from the select committee, uh, large and, and accepted a large number of them, and the bill has necessarily become bigger. Uh, the draft building safety bill was around 119 clauses, which I already thought was uh, a mammoth bill. It's now 147 clauses uh, with nine schedules instead of eight. Uh, and we're now in six parts for the bill rather than, than five. Um, I thought um, rather, I mean, clearly this is a critical uh, bill, at least from the important work that Dame Judith, who will be speaking to you today, carried out with her review. It establishes the building safety regulator uh, for um, high-rise um, uh, residential buildings, but also hospitals above 18 metres and care homes. That's written into the face of the bill, which was one of the recommendations of the, um, of the select committee. Uh, but I thought I should just highlight some of the areas where the bill has changed since introduction. Um, firstly, we've um, extended homeowners' rights to comp co compensation um, looking at uh, a longer limitation period under Section 1 of the Defective Premises Act from 6 to 15 years, applying that uh, retrospectively. Um, uh, so that's um, strengthening redress. Um, we've also been cognizant of many of the criticisms around the drafting around the building safety charge to make sure that the charge will now only cover the ongoing costs of implementing um, this new regime, not the costs of uh, remediating historic building safety defects. So that's been made very clear in the revised bill, uh, as well as strengthening uh, so some of the protections, trying to strengthen protections for leaseholders by um, insisting on um, um, that current leaseholders um, um, are only, there's only a call from the, the building owner, the freeholder, um, to get them to contribute to costs after they've um, um, gone through um, uh, all alternative funding routes, including through government grant, finance, warranties, insurance, and litigation. So there's that protection for leaseholders added into the bill. But those are three changes I wanted to um, draw attention to the, to the to the group today. Now, um, that's a lot. There's a lot. A lot, lot. These are two major bits of legislation. Um, they are obviously progressing in parallel. The building safety bill will be going through. Uh, the House of Commons. Uh, I've started, obviously, with the um, the first wave of leasehold reform in in the House of Lords. Uh, it's a very busy time, and, and both bills are incredibly important. If we want to learn the lessons from Grenfell, but also given opportunities um, to establish a, a new system uh, around common hold um, in the future in this country, and give the leaseholders a chance uh, to become. Um, you know, uh, uh, um, homeowners as, as, as many um, are able to on the continent. So that's what all, I, all I would like to say in, 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 uh, at this point and happy to take questions when the chair deems it right to do so. Hilary. Martin, thank you very much indeed. And Stephen, thank you for that update. Um, on, you, you talked about historic safety defects. Leaving aside the cladding defects, which the government says it's prepared to pay for, who do you think should pay for the historic safety defects that are not covered by the government's funding? So flammable insulation, missing fire breaks, wooden balconies, those kind of things. Who's going to foot the bill for that? Because, as you know, um, leaseholders... Um, are currently being asked to cough up the cash and uh, clearly they shouldn't pay. So who do you think should pay? And how's that going to work? Thank you. S Stephen, you have to take yourself off mute. Oh, sorry. Well, that's, I'm um, sorry about that, Hilary. I was, I was trying to make sure I, I was courteous in muting myself whilst you spoke and then forgot to unmute, apologies. Um, no, it, it, the first thing to say is that every building needs to be looked at at an individual level, but largely, if I was to generalize, many of the defects you outline are certainly in contravention of building um, regulations then or at any time. Uh, and then so in terms of the, 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 I think that would then falls on the responsibility of the person who, who, who built the building uh, uh, and that the developers need to front up and pay for the, a lot of these, um, these defects that, that you mentioned. Um, but I'm aware that sometimes 
warranty periods um, have, um, have passed. And that, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to uh, take this opportunity to strengthen the mechanisms around redress. And um, can I just follow that up with what happens where the developer and the builder have gone bust and no longer exist? Who's going to pay then? Well, I mean, there, will, there are circumstances, as, and you know, you, it's a kind of question where you know the answer, but I, the answer is that it can, in law, as things stand, and landlord tenant law over many, many years, and the way leases are um, uh, today, it, will, it can, in, those, in some circumstances, and particularly the circumstance you've outlined, it can fall on, on the leaseholder, where there's no developer um, uh, available to go after, as you say. And then the choice is, do we, does the taxpayer front up all the cash for all of this? or the leaseholder? That is indeed the question. No, thank you, Stephen. Um, da Daisy. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, hi, Stephen. Uh, a couple of questions from me. I mean, the first is that, um, as you know, there's been a, a major cross-party push to try and protect leaseholders from any of the uh -huh of uh, remediating fire safety defects that are not of their making. Um, the government has variously made different pledges at different times about, first of all, saying that leaseholders would be protected from those costs, and then saying that leaseholders, leaseholders would be protected from unaffordable costs. Um, uh, and now there's sort of legislation, which as you just admitted, will allow some costs to go to leaseholders. Um, and yet there hasn't really been any discussion about if there's not going to be legislation to protect leaseholders from all costs, what do you regard as an acceptable or an affordable cost? Because many leaseholders are getting bills for 60, 70, 80, 90, 100,000 pounds, which they cannot afford. Uh, and so some clarity on that would be helpful. Um, and then the second uh, question really, is that as you know, the Cladding Action Group um, and others put a 10 point plan forward to the government, um, suggesting that it could be the government that puts the money forward in the first place and then uses its power of being in government to recoup those costs. Uh, and in the absence of doing that, uh, we're effectively asking leaseholders who are many of whom are not legal experts, who are potentially suffering from mental ill health, who are stuck in their homes, uh, who are potentially facing bankruptcy. And we're asking them to take on the burden of trying to sue these mega enormous powerful companies uh, when they do not have the financial resources or the mental resilience or the wherewithal to do so. So I just wonder if there's, if you can give us any explanation as to why there's, if there's any objection to the government stepping in to do that on behalf of leaseholders, because that's what I think many people would like to see. Well, I mean, clearly um, the, uh, the focus that we've had as a government is to, to recognize that not all building safety defects are equal, uh, that uh, cladding is an accelerant of the spread of fire. Um, and then we've seen that on time and time again in high rise residential buildings. And we've focused our intervention uh, around um, helping uh, to fund the costs of um, the remediation of cladding uh, where uh, the warranties uh, or the developers not um, at, at this stage in a position to or won't um, fund that remediation. Uh, with regards to the other building um, safety works, and we really need to know the extent of the problem there, but at this stage, uh, you're right, at the moment, um, if the building owner uh, or the developer, the original developer doesn't step forward, then uh, you know the, the, the leaseholders are are facing um, you know, the, the, the costs of that remediation. And I recognize that in some cases, these are life-changing costs, and I, but that's the situation, as you know, we, we, we are in. This is, this is a, a problem that has brewed up over many, many decades. Uh, and it's already requiring quite a considerable increase in uh, government um, support for leaseholders in the sense that you know, over the period of time that I've held office, which is just a little over a year, we've moved from a 600 million fund for ACM cladding to a 5.1 billion of funding to remediate cladding. So we recognize this is a, a huge problem and recognize also that, um, this, you know, there are, that, that, you know, that we, we aren't covering those non-cladding defects at this stage as a government. Okay, thank, thank you that. Well, we have one more um, uh, question um, from um, David uh, Bishop, David. Uh, th thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Stephen, for, for your replies uh, to this. And, uh, you know, this really was a kind of poison chalice that you've inherited when you came into, into post and grateful for the courteous way in which, you, in which you, you, you're, you're dealing with it. Um, 
I guess for me, the situation won't be over until people are able to to sell their property and get a get a decent price for it. I mean, that that for me is the at the acid test. Whether whether the problem is cladding or whether it's because cladding has exposed so much else that uh, that is wrong in in high and medium rise. Uh, dwellings in this country and particularly because a, a lot of people you know if I look at the flats in Manchester Salford in, in, in my patch you know, these, these are often uh, young young households uh, they get to the point where where they you know, ha have kids form, form a family and it's no longer quite so appropriate to live in a in a high or medium rise uh, rise block and of course these these folks are stuck at the moment they're not able to to to, to, to sell their property and so is, can you give me give us any sense of when there'll be closure on this for those people who are at the moment are stuck where they don't really want to live because their, their, their personal circumstances have changed but are unable to get out? Well, I, I recognise, uh, um, Bishop David, that um, you're, you're talking about the wider housing problem where um, a number of people are in buildings that need to be remediated. They fail the, the, EWS, the, they fail the EWS1 survey or equivalent um, required by the banks, and then um, they're waiting then, uh, therefore, for... Um, the remediation to happen um, that will enable the value to return in their property, which is one of the reasons why we're focusing on interventions that um, make sure that we move quickly in that regard. Um, and um, the first wave of the Building Safety Fund has been on a first come first served basis. We've tried to um, ensure that we support um, the training of more assessors that can carry out the work because um, there have not been enough of them. Um, we're looking at, uh, so I think we've trained, it's around close to 900 um, building surveyors to add to the uh, small number of fire engineers that are um, currently covered to do this work um, so that the, the, these can be carried out um, more quickly. Uh, we also recognize that there's um, a problem, particularly around professional indemnity insurance around this particular form. Um, so we're trying to develop a, an intervention that supports that. Um, all of these are small incremental measures um, that we hope um, to deal with what we recognise is a, a significant problem for these young people caught in this situation to enable them to um, get, uh, the, the, you know, to, to get the, the stuff sorted out so they can move on with their lives. Um, but what I would say, um, and this is something become a phrase that um, I think we all need to um, call for, is that we need greater proportionality uh, and that we need to see the insurers, um, the lenders, um, you know, not it shouldn't have a binary response that something that was worth hundreds of thousands of pounds is now written down on their books as of no value. Um, but we need so we so we're doing all we can to engage with um, the, the banks and with um, insurance companies to be more proportionate in their in their assessments, uh, and that that's incredibly important. And that that word proportion is important because I know that many people are worried about the life safety implications, but you know, statistically, with the exception of 2017, uh, uh, the number of deaths that are in high rises is very, very low, actually. It was three in the last year uh, and has remained very, very low and trending downwards um, over the last decade. So we recognize the need to remediate these buildings um, from a life safety standpoint, um, but very few fires spread from the uh, room of origin. Um, uh, obviously, when they do, it can be very can be tragic. Um, so we're, we're working as a government and engaging very extensively on, on how we can get a more proportionate response to these matters. Good afternoon. And uh, thanks, Ted. Good to see you. And uh, really, really great presentation. Um, I'll keep this very brief. Martin, uh, because I think you've you've heard you've heard a lot from Stephen already, um, but you asked me to come along and brief people on on what I'm doing currently and some of my um, personal thoughts on all of this. Uh, the ongoing activity I'm involved with is is one setting up the new regulator. So I chair the the transition board that is setting up the new building safety regulator that's mentioned in the bill. Uh, and as you know, I've been chairing the industry safety steering group for three years now, we do have to take industry on a journey to recognise the need to raise standards. And that is a big task. We cannot just do this by regulatory reform. And the amount of work that is going into raising those standards in the industry is enormous. Uh, earlier on today, I was involved in, in uh, we've been meeting with, with 
the, the industry again about how we can move them further and faster because as Ted said, we have got to fix this problem for the future. That is not to belittle the problem that we are living with in terms of the current issues. But what I thought was particularly interesting in Ted's presentation was the important message he shared with us about needing to fix the highest priorities and to focus our attention where it is most needed. And I think that's a really important lesson that we need to heed and build into our plans for dealing with the current challenge. But having said that, my main message today is it really is important that we fix this problem for the future, because if we don't fix it, the problem that we're living with is getting bigger. And whilst, as I said, I think we have to uh, have some real uh, hard discussions about how we do do that in terms of the current issues and try and remove some of these obstacles with insurance, with lending, with unnecessary work, I suspect, taking place in a lot of buildings right now, which is putting even more burden onto people than, than, is, than is necessary. Um, I am absolutely sure that it is right and proper that this building safety bill comes into being and that we actually change the system on a once in a generation basis so that we put a stop to this poor standard of building that has been going on around the world for years. And that's really all I want to say. Peter, would you like to begin to close the meeting? Thank you, Martin. Um, I'm Peter Bottomley. I'm one of the co-chairs uh, with Justin Meadows, now joined by Daisy Cooper, the Liberal Democrat. And I want to mention our three vice chairs, Alison Thewlis, Scottish National Party, Fleur Anderson Labour, and Stephen McPartland, who did so much on the fire safety bill, Conservative as well. Uh, we've obviously learnt the fine, fix, and fund. We haven't solved all that. It's tremendous to work with David Amos and the fire safety group. Thank you for that. Uh, the point I would make to the minister, and if the minister's officials are still there, it's probable that most leaseholders can't have an easy way to claim their losses. Can they assign their right to sue or to have a claim taken for them by a central public agency to achieve redress without risking more money they don't have? Landlords won't do it on their behalf without indemnity costs. A second technical question, government intends to get back, say, four billion in tax and levy. Does that offset the five billion they're putting into the cladding or does it uh, add to the money? If leaseholders are facing 10 billion more, where does that come from and when? Uh, I've asked the Prime Minister for a leasehold summit, haven't heard back yet. I want to thank LKP, the leasehold, National Leasehold Campaign, the cladding groups for all that they've done. And I'm passing across to Daisy Cooper, I want to praise her for her 10 minute rule bill on the public inquiry into the building safety crisis. Over to you, Daisy. Thank you, Peter. Um, I simply just want to say a huge thank you to Martin for organising uh, this fantastic meeting today. Thank you all so much for giving of your time. Um, and I just want to say how refreshing it was to hear from Ted. Goodness me, so pithy. We treated it as a public safety issue. Loans don't work. Three stories and higher have all to be treated as an emergency and the government coughs up the cash. I mean, it just sounds so simple, doesn't it? Uh, meanwhile, in Westminster, we're getting ourselves all tangled in knots and red tape and confusing uh, confusing ideas whilst leaseholders um, are at their wits end with their mental health in tatters, scared to be in homes that they can't sell. Um, so I want to thank all of our speakers today, especially to, to Ted for giving such a, a fantastically clear and comprehensive route forward. Uh, I would echo the comments of everybody in the chat who was trying to uh, offer you a job. Maybe we could crowdfund a salary for you. Um, maybe that's what we need to do to, to get you on the government books. But uh, thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to Peter. Thank you to Martin as well. And we'll continue to fight through the Building Safety Fund and every other mechanism uh, to, to make sure that your voices are heard in Parliament.